Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us today for uh, NAGT or National Association of Geosciences uh, teacher teaching webinar series. Uh, the webinar today is going to be about teaching online introductory geoscience labs. We have a pretty big group right now, uh, over about 130 people. So I think this is going to end up being a really robust discussion discussion when we get into the the breakout sessions. Um, I just want to say before we get started here, this is a, a special webinar that was somewhat driven by the geoscience community really looking for best practices and strategies for online teaching. So thank you to everybody who contributed to all those early discussions that helped lead to this uh, webinar. And as we get started, I want to highlight on this first screen that we would like everybody to, to be muted during the, at least the first half of the webinar, and you can find that on the on the Zoom menu bar. Um, and the video, many of you have a video on, I think that's fine, but if you if your video is off, you can do that also on the bottom left. You can see the participants um, on this menu bar, and also we'll use the chat throughout the, the webinar where if people need to add comments or ask questions, we'll do that through the chat predominantly, at least for the webinar portion, portion the discussion people will do more communicating in small groups. Um, so, and we'll also, when we get to the end of the presentations, we'll have a question and answer period after the breakout session. So we'll try to keep track of questions and thoughts as we go. Okay. So I just want to highlight a few things about this webinar. This is part of the NAGT webinar series. Uh, you can join the NAGT webinar. Um, see, you can join the NAGT through the uh, link on the bottom left here. You can also see the full schedule of the NAGT webinar series through the link on the center of the page. And some of these can get added to the chat. And then if you're interested in getting involved with NAGT or learning about the, the broader range of resources that NAGT has, you can also follow this link here to get to these projects. NAGT sponsors a range of projects and programs uh, for geoscience broadly. And we really have an extensive series of webinars and materials that people can access. Um, so I, I really, recommend checking those things out. Okay, so before we get started with the, the details of the webinar, I just want to give a brief outline so people know where we're headed. First, uh, Bridget and Adrian are going to give presentations that are going to cover online student engagement and examples of online geoscience labs. Then we'll move into a set of breakout sessions where we'll have small group discussions to share opportunities, concerns, uh, for teaching online introductory labs. And then we'll come back for a whole group discussion where Bridget and Adrian will, will answer questions um, based on those breakout sessions and any other questions that arise. So just to give a sense of how the breakout sessions will work, I'll, I'll say this again right before we move into these. Uh, one, there will be multiple breakout rooms. Each one of these rooms will have a facilitator and a Google Doc that will be used to share resources, ideas, thoughts. Also, people will be able to talk during the session, but if, if you're moving quickly and want to add things directly to the Google Doc, you'll be able to do that. And we'll, we'll put links to those as well when we get to the breakout session part of the webinar. Um, you'll be assigned automatically to one of these breakout rooms. So when you see the banner that says join breakout room, please just click on that link. Okay, so our two panelists today are both experienced educators and, and also especially experienced online educators. They're Bridget James from San Francisco State University and Adrian Lineback from Wake Technical Community College. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bridget. Bridget, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. So thanks for coming to our webinar today. Uh, what I'd like to do first is address engagement in an online laboratory environment. So engagement is super important to making sure students focus on learning. 
you're not going to be right there in front of them in most cases. So having them want to be there will help. And there are different things you can do that together will help your students be fully engaged in your courses. So the types of engagement I want to cover briefly are emotional, behavioral, cognitive, and cultural. Emotional is the positive feelings your students will have towards your course. Behavioral is the effort, involvement, attention, persistence that they'll have in your course. Uh, cognitive is the active learning that they'll have in your course. And the cultural is the inclusive environment, removing the bias and stereotypes uh, from your courses. It's really important. It's in a really important way to get online students to focus on learning instead of disengaging disappearing or cheating. Obviously, uh, cheating is one of the things we think about when we move to online. And this is one of the first line of defenses you can do to uh, prevent that from happening. So let's go to the next slide. So I want to go over a few measures that you can implement so that your lab courses are covering all the types of engagements uh, that I just went over. So um, the first is meaningful laboratories. What I mean by that is um, make sure your content is tying into uh, your regional issues in, uh, that your students would be interested in. Um, for example, in California, things that I see in my lecture courses, like um, in the forms in my lecture courses online, uh, wildfire, drought, and climate are some of the big topics right now. So you wanna try to tie that into your laboratory courses as best you can and as much as you can, because that'll, that'll create some really good engagement right off the bat. You want to be able to foster a sense of confidence. Students are going to ask themselves, can I do this? And they already do that in your lab classroom in person. So if, you're on, if they're online and they're in their car, their office, their uh, bedroom, and they're looking at your lab, they're going to ask that probably even more um, to themselves. So, uh, some things you can do to help with that sense of confidence is keep it simple at first um, and then stay slightly beyond the student's current level of proficiency while keeping in mind that you may not be right there with them. And you guys are, are pretty well attuned to what you can do in the classroom. So you just have to kind of imagine them in their bedroom or their office or car and, and try to figure out, you know, how you best can um, lead them uh, so that you're fostering that confidence along the way. Um, active learning exercises, you don't want to stop doing that. You're probably already doing that in your labs. Um, by definition, you want to continue that cognitive engagement, um, keeping memorization and regurgitation of course material at a minimum. In fact, that might be something you could put at the beginning to help them get started so that they start feeling that sense of comp uh, confidence and then, um, then move along to more um, thoughtful types of uh, questions later on. So let's go to the next slide. You want to keep a positive instructor-student relationship. That's, that's extremely important also. Um, one of the most important things I have found in my online courses um, is if I answer emails quickly, the students feel confident that they can get a hold of me again later that quickly. And, and sometimes they don't even get back to me later in the course, but the fact that they feel like they can hear from me right away gives them the confidence they need to continue on with the course and move through it. And in fact, in my course evaluations that I have at the end of, of semesters, that's one of the big ones that students tell me is, is a big deal, is hearing back from me very quickly. You also want to have clear expectations, your rubrics, uh, student learning outcomes, uh, where it's appropriate to put in your courses. You want to uh, not feel shy about putting that everywhere um, so that they can easily find it. And then that feedback in lieu of or in addition to a grade is also really important in an online environment because it helps uh, either reassure them that they're doing really well or lets them know quickly where they're going astray so that they can get back on track um, easily. And in online, that's obviously going to be really important. Uh, in person, it is also, but don't want to remove that in the online environment. Um, and you want to create collaborative learning opportunities. You don't want to remove that. Um, in the classroom, it looks a lot different. Um, but you want to actually still provide them an opportunity to work together, them being the students. Um, and one of the obvious ways to do that, maybe a discussion board, maybe one for each lab, or you can create a thread for each lab and have them be able to organically communicate with each other, or you could set up groups, um, however you want to handle that. Google Docs is another way with which you can have students work collaboratively. In fact, in the breakout session, we'll be working with Google Docs today, so you'll 
if you haven't worked with them before, you can get a little introduction to how that might work and how you might be able to implement that in your uh, labs for the fall if it's appropriate. But you want to make sure you have, have them working collaboratively in some way. Um, you also want to create an inclusive online environment to help with engagement. You want to make your course relevant to diverse populations. You want to remove those biases and stereotypes. You want to meet students where they are culturally um, because the more relevant the course is to their lives, the more they're going to engage. And in fact, the more they might be likely to major in geosciences as well, which is a big deal um, for a lot of us. So let's go to the next slide. And I've uh, selected a few references that I'd like uh, you to look at when you have a, a moment. I think these references will be really good additions to as you're working on your fall 2020 lab classes to uh, keep in mind as you're, as you're putting those labs together today or um, uh, this summer. So. Um, so that's it for my part of the presentation. I guess uh, Adrian would be next. All right, next slide, please. All right. Um, one thing to think about before you decide what you're going to do for labs is, is this going to be the only semester you're probably going to teach online? Or are you planning on maybe moving towards some of your classes will be online in the future? And that's going to make a difference, probably the amount of time that you're going to put in on some of these labs. Um, the other thing that I think about, because I teach seated and online and some hybrids, so sometimes what I'm trying to think about is, you know, what will I have to do to be able to use it in both sections? One great thing that going online might do for you right now is have you attended a workshop and there was some great integrate module or some other module that you saw that you really wanted to put in your CD class? Well, make that one of your online labs right now and then turn around and use it as an activity in your CD class when you get there later. Um, another thing that it might be a great time to start adding is if you're tired of teaching some math in some of your classes, maybe it's time to start throwing in some of the math you need modules in your online lab, test them out and see how they're going to work in your CD class when you go back. Um, some other things I think about when I'm putting together labs for my online students um, is will the students or you need any special technology to access it? Because if students are going to need to buy an app or do something different, that's going to create a lot of problems when you go through to be able to um, start working on that lab. How much will it take to take whatever lab you're looking at and turn it into a lab that you can use both in your seated and online classes? And that's going to make a difference if you're turning around doing some quick turnaround for fall. The labs that are going to be really complicated, you might want to put off for a little bit and, and put some of the labs that you can get going for the fall right now. <clears throat> you want to choose labs that um, maybe you can use in the future as a makeup assignment for one of your seated labs if there's a problem. So there's you know, a good time if you're putting this time and it's not going to be something that you wouldn't use in the future if you could use it that way. And um, the other thing you really want to look at is can students easily download and work with the data that you're asking them to download or present if you're doing it in an online lab? And that's something you really want to play with because if it takes, if you have to have Excel and can't use it in a different program or those kind of things, that's going to present a problem. So play around with that and go through the data and take a look and really make sure that it's going to be something that all your students are going to be able to use when you start downloading the data. Um, next slide, please. So some of the tips <clears throat> that I'm going to say that's really going to help when you're putting these together. Um, some of the technology I'm going to talk about in the labs I use today is something just like Google Earth. But even getting some of your students that may not be more technology savvy to be able to download Google Earth is a little bit of a trick. So um, I suggest making videos and online screen captures because you can show a picture and show them where to click versus putting down a couple hundred words to say the same thing. So a really good idea to, um, whenever possible, throw pictures in and small videos that help the students get to where they need to be able to download and use some of the technology that you're trying to guide them through. Um, I'll also say it is even more important in your online class is to try test run out. Um, because if you're in a seated class and there's a mistake or a problem, 
you get to tell your students once. Trust me, if there is a mistake in your online class, you will have 50 emails telling you that there is a problem before you're even able to start. So it's nice to catch some of those before they go. So one of the things I do with all my material online is I try it on my Windows computer, I try it on my Mac, I try it using Google Chrome, I try it using Firefox. So that way when I start getting emails from students going, it's not working with what I'm doing, I can say, well, what browser are you using? Or I can tell them in advance, you're gonna to need to use this browser because there's problems when you try to do it in one of the other browsers. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, and, and the way this is worded sounds funny, I realized when I was running through the slides earlier, but I'll let you know what I mean by it, is what do you want your students to get out of the lab? And, um, and that may make a difference in how many tries you give them in the lab. And so like one of the things, we had to do our summer labs a little different than we normally do our online labs. And when I'm in a seated class, and maybe you guys do it different, but like for my mineral lab, very rarely are my students gonna miss the minerals because I'm actually walking around in the lab. And if the student has the wrong mineral name down, I'll stop and go, okay, why do you think it's that? What do you wanna do with this? Or, or why don't you try the streak plate? Can that really be what you thought it was? So rarely are my students gonna miss a mineral because I go through them with them and sort of make sure they get them right when we're in lab. Well, is it fair that my online students don't get that same, you know, do I just wanna give them one chance and if they miss it, oh well. So I sort of give different opportunities on how many tries they get in the mineral lab. They actually get multiple tries on identifying the minerals. And when they get down to the questions I'm asking them, they only get one try. So that way I'm giving them more opportunity to learn the segments of the lab that I really want them to pay attention to. And you've got to figure out, you're gonna have those students that if you give them multiple tries, they're gonna do nothing but go through and just click every single one till one of them works and they move on. They're not gonna get what you want, but that's gonna come back to get them later when they do other things. So that's what I meant by, um, what do you want your students to get out of it? And that way you can make decisions on how many opportunities they're gonna to have to perhaps go through the lab. Um, next slide, please, Lori. Um, in our ideal situation, since we've been teaching online labs since, I guess, 2001, 2002, this is sort of what we normally send home with our students. So we have a box of minerals and rocks, street plate, um, magnet, hand lens, glass plate that goes home. And then we also send a lab book that we've written so that it can be used for both our seated and online students two laminated topographic maps, one to do an exercise with, one to use on the final exam, little North Carolina geology map tucked away up there. And then I also send home a bag of a mineral quiz and a rock quiz. And I have a variety of them, so all the students don't have the same one. So they actually are quizzed on their minerals and rocks at home. Um, next slide, please. So this sort of goes through what we normally send home with our students and why I say what we normally do. Um, we have about 200 of these kits because that usually meets about what we normally have with our online sections. But in the fall, all of our students are gonna be online as opposed to just our normal 200. So we're not gonna be able to use those supplies that we normally send home, we're not gonna have enough. Um, so what I did, um, was actually create some labs. And so you'll see at the bottom here, I'll talk about it, include introductory videos for each lab. One of our instructors actually went through every lab that we usually send home with students and did sort of the same sort of introductory lab you would normally do in your seated class. And we have them out there on YouTube that the students are given a link to. It goes, it introduces the lab, shows them what they're trying to do, and tends to work a lot better than just introducing via um, text, email, or words. So I would suggest whenever possible, throw in and show yourself doing some of the work and, um, and exactly what you would want your students to see if you were doing that in a seated lab. Next slide. Um, so this semester, since we're not gonna be able to send home these kits, this is just a picture of one of the videos that I made, but I took every single mineral and rock that we use both in our online kits and the ones that we use in our seated labs. And I made a video for every mineral and rock. And I went through all the steps that the student would normally do doing the identification. And so that way the student can actually 
go through, record the information in the table, and they're still responsible for identifying what mineral or rock that they have. Um, it was a good amount of work, but be ideal about it in the future is we can pull whichever videos we want of those, whether it's a seated or online student. And if one of my seated students can't make it to lab, instead of trying to work around and come and do a special lab for them, now I can actually just give them these videos online and they'll get the same minerals that all their counterparts got in the seated lab, but they can use it as a makeup lab. Next slide, please. Um, some other labs that we use in our classes that students can go on and download data and do some different things with is topographic map labs and contouring. Um, we use a stream lab um, that uses Google Earth, a volcano lab that uses Google Earth, earthquake lab that uses Google Earth, and a mass wasting lab that uses Google Earth. Um, next slide. So I was going to talk a little bit about one of the stream labs we put together. Um, this stream lab uses Google Earth, where we send students to certain um, Latin longitudes and we give them the altitude that they should be looking at the picture. And then what we do is ask them what sort of stream pattern they see. We might have a move upstream or downstream, talk about what they're seeing with the stream, why they're seeing that particular pattern there. Um, we also needed an assignment last semester to report out on some quantitative literacy. So we threw into this lab where we had them go to different points, measure a slope of the stream. We had them measure the width and the depth and gave them some um, other measurements, had them come out and do discharge. So we were able to throw some of the quantitative literacy in there and, um, and put together, I think, a pretty good lab using some of the math. Um, next slide, please. Some of the other technology that I like that goes along in our stream lab is a topo.com where the students can toggle back and forth between looking at the topographic view versus looking at um, the satellite imagery. And this particular lab has the students go to a local mall that we have and they sort of track it down moving across. And this mall floods and if we're looking at the topo map we see why this mall floods every single time it rains because there is a creek right behind it. But we asked the students some questions like, okay, go look at the topographic line there, where the stream, and, and now see why does this mall flood every single time that we see a big rain coming through. Um, next slide. And once the students have actually gone through and looked at that, I actually have them follow that stream that runs behind the mall, and they run down to where they find a stream gauging station. And so I just wanted them to get them look. I asked them some questions about when the stream winds, when it, um, if it's wider here, but we see it move a little further down, what's going to happen to the discharge when it gets wider and those sorts of things. And then when they get to the gauging station, I actually have them go to the USGS website and download the data from the gauging station for like the last 20 years. And then I have instructions that have them move through Excel and produce a flood frequency curve and then I ask them questions about what we've seen on that flood frequency curve for the last few years. And um, there's a lot of a lot of things students are having to go through there in between getting your Google Earth Pro, getting the topo.com and going to the USGS gauging station. But we probably had last semester because we used it both in our seated and online labs, we probably had about 500 to 600 students do it last semester and only had two that had issues with getting through the different data. So, um, so I don't think you're going to find if you want to throw in some of this kind of stuff, students having big problems. And, and if you consider, you would like to think your online students are typically going to be better because they signed up for an online class, but that's not going to be the case with everybody that we have in the fall since some of those students may not have wanted it online and wanted it seated. But I still think that they'll be able to move through some of this technology and it'll be something that's somewhat exciting for them. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of our instructors came up with using Google Earth for both a volcano and an earthquake lab, and my students loved it. I've done it this summer. And so students actually go to the sites that you give them with different types of volcanoes, and you have them 
um, go into certain sites, look at it, measure the slope of the volcano, measure the perimeter, figuring out how tall it is. And um, then once the students have done that, you give them some information and they come up with what type of volcano it is, what type of rocks they would expect to see around it, and a whole series of questions. And I think it really drives home much better when they're looking at the actual pictures of these different volcanoes, that when they do the measurements, they understand much more the difference in the sizes of the volcanoes and the slopes and those kind of things as they move through. And um, it's something that, like I said, I used online this summer. I'll probably turn this in and use it as activities and maybe not labs in my CD class, but we'll definitely use them there too because the students got a lot out of it. Um, the next slide, please. Um, same thing with an earthquake lab. We took the data that we normally have students go in and plot on the maps and do the, the circles. We gave them the same seismographs, so they did all the same work, got their P minus S, um, figured out distance from epicenter, but then we had them go and find the seismograph station locations in Google Earth, given the Latin longitude, and then it has a way you can create circles that go out the exact distance that you want them to, so the students see even better how those circles are gonna meet because they just go to the three seismograph stations, draw the circles out to the width that they need to be. And then you can ask them all kinds of questions because the students are actually looking at it, you know, map view, where are you? What kind of plate boundary are you near? Why are you seeing these kind of things? Mm -hmm. So a lot of things you would normally just be doing in the lab book, the students are actually getting a much better view and getting a much better, they're not having to I always have students when I do it online have trouble drawing the circles. So now Google Earth doing it for them and um, their answers are going to be much better than what you typically see. And like I said, I've used this one this summer also and, um, and students liked it. Um, I think the one other thing that I was going to mention and I didn't put in here is I do also do a mass wasting lab using Google Earth where students can go in and look at pictures and you can actually use pictures from the past and the present. So you can do a before and after um, a big landslide or maybe a before and after a hurricane, watch a movement sediment. And then um, what I do is have students go and read articles that I give them on the different things. So they've looked at it and then ask them a series of questions where they pick out the triggers for the um, mass wasting event talk about monetary um, damage, any loss of life, could it have been prevented, what they might do to prevent it in the future. And um, that's been something that's worked well for me in the past also. All right, I think that's it from my part. Um, or did we wanna just move ahead with the next slide or any questions? Yeah, thanks, thanks Adrian. Let's move on to uh, Vince quickly here. Uh, Vince, did you want to talk about the lab manual? Okay, there we go. Everybody hear me? Um, yeah, one option that I just wanted to bring up for you is uh, NIGT has um, published for three decades a lab manual that uh, has been written primarily by NIGT members. And it's, it's an awfully good option if you're looking for one, I, I use it in remote and online classes myself. And uh, it has um, a good deal of information in each chapter that a student can read before they attempt the activities. And then the activities, um, there, there are many new activities. There's an entirely new climate, cha climate change chapter at the moment. Um, at any rate, uh, what uh, you should know is that people who buy this uh, lab manual, access to paper or e-text, whatever, um, proceeds go to help fund NAGT and AGI. So that makes it a significantly different lab manual. There is a webinar about the new edition of the lab manual. You can see the link up on the, the screen. And if you have any questions about the lab manual and how it might be used in this kind of a context, just send me an email. I'll be happy to converse with you about it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Vince, and thanks uh, especially to Bridget and Adrian. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move into the breakout sessions. And uh, I, I know there are a lot of comments and questions in the chat.
chat and some of those questions we'll, we'll bring on to the whole group discussion at the end, but I think the breakout sessions will also uh, answer some of those questions and also create many new ones. Um, so again, each group will have a facilitator and a Google Doc. Um, everybody will be assigned a room automatically. So as soon as Mitchell initiates the breakout room, each person will, will get a little message that says join breakout room and, and please do that. Um, once you get there. So Mitchell, take it away. All right, is everybody back? Um, I don't know, Bridget, do you, I see we have one question from, um, sort of, or two that sort of go together about um, how we're gonna get students to work together, especially since if everybody's truly being online, it's gonna be harder to get students to have to meet at certain times. Um, I can tell you what I've seen from a couple of our instructors that teach online. Um, some of, one of our instructors does something that I don't do and she may actually, I think she was one of the facilitators today, but what she does is have her students in the discussion board. They're sort of allowed to talk about anything from lab. So just like if you were working with a partner in lab and that's, you're talking to each other and you're allowed to ask the question, I think it's this, what did you think? those students are allowed to do that in her discussion board. So like while it might be off limits sometimes when you've got students doing assignments for them to discuss the questions, she encourages it. She says, yep, go to the discussion board. And if you're not sure about something, say, hey, for number four, I thought it was this, am I right? And she just lets the students go with those kind of discussion boards. And she has a great, she's had great success with it. As I have not tried that exact thing yet, but she has had great success with students doing that. Um, let's see, Bridget, do you see other, any other questions to, you can address or what do we got here? Adrian, while you're looking, there were also people asking about um, what the level of that Streamlab was for, for whether it's for introductory geoscience courses um, and then if you had videos, any of the intro videos that, that might be available. Um, we do have, um, it's an intro geology course. So, um, you know, pretty much whatever your intro. And the questions are, you know, they're, they're probably not ones that I would probably do for a majors class, although we've had majors going through, but, and it could be used probably in, in a high school or modified to use in the different places. And what I will do um, is I can make a link. So I can put links into some of the videos to be able to get there. The um, stream video, I'm actually happy to share also. It is in soft chalk. I don't know if anybody has that, um, but you should be able to access it even without having soft chalk. You just might not be able to make changes in it if you don't have soft chalk. So I'm happy to share that and some of the videos that we use for, for our labs. And somebody also had the question about how we get our kits back. Um, and when we went to the discussion meetings, if you're going to use kits, one of the things that we do is we don't want to have to replace those every semester. It's a lot of work because we make them ourselves. So we put holds on students' accounts if they don't return them. So I was saying I've actually had kits come back five years later because a student needed to register or needed transcripts. And so five years later, they brought me their supplies back. So we put holds on accounts and typically we get most of the kits back because we've shipped them cross country and still gotten them back by the end of the semester. And yes, the links will be available for the, the chats. Um, Roy, I'll let you say whether it be, but they'll be able to go back and look at those and be able to look at the links that um, Bridget and I both provided. Yeah, mo most of the resources will be added to the webinar webpage. So when, when the recording's available, Mitchell will send out an email to all the registrants and from there you'll be able to get to the webinar webpage. It is, the webinar webpage exists now, but with those resources, they'll be up after the webinar. One of the things that was brought up in my in the room I was in was uh, that, that I I don't think was broached in the main um, presentation was that um, labs tend to take longer online than in person. So a lab that you would normally do in person would take much longer during um, an online session. So keep that in mind when you're writing those labs too about the time it takes for the students to get through and working in groups um, online is it'll take a little bit longer to do that if you're going to do synchronous labs or um, 
asynchronous, I guess it's not as big a deal because they have more time over a course of a week, maybe, but, but synchronous labs in particular may take a little longer than you think, given the dynamic there and people getting used to being online and things like that. I would suggest to taking the video or instructions that you wrote and giving it to your partner or your kids. And so what I do is I give them to my kids and say, go see if you can do this. And they'll come back and go, I got stuck right here. So that's a really good thing to show, okay, the instructions were not quite clear enough to get you where you needed to go. So yeah, use some, make your kids be some free labor and go through your lab for you and make sure that you put all the instructions in you need to be able to get through it. I've found that seventh graders are particularly good at that task <laughs> because they're so excited to be working on something that college kids would work on. And, and they're actually smart as, you know, they need to be uh, for most of these lab activities. So um, I, I make a lot of use of seventh graders uh, for the lab book. Bridget, in, in the group I was in, we were talking a, a good bit about how to make resources more relevant or materials more relevant to your students or culture relevant. Could you speak to that a little bit? Do you have any suggestions? Um, basically, as far as culturally relevant goes, I, I suggest getting more familiar with, with especially if you're a white person teaching, um, because there's a lot of things that um, you, you think you may know, but you really don't until you start doing digging in and doing some reading and research. So that's probably the first thing. Um, but then some of those links I provided have some reading, but also has some suggestions to go through your assignments and your LMS. Um, to help make things more culturally relevant too. Um, things like uh, scientist spotlights where you're actually spotlighting scientists of um, underrepresented groups more. Um, just visuals can help, visual cues, how you speak about things, um, how you approach um, can make a really big difference. So it's kind of an overall thing um, primarily, but also just making sure you understand better um, how to culturally meet your students across the board. Okay, maybe one more question or comment, then we'll, we'll need to wrap up as it's almost one o'clock uh, central time at least. Um, Adrian or Bridget, do you have any last comments you wanna make based on what you've seen or talked about in your groups? See if there's any last. I, um, I think, uh, Cheating was brought up, um, which you know is mostly thought of about with exams, but you know labs too um, could. But you know most times students are working in groups. If it's synchronous, it's kind of difficult to cheat on that. But um, if it's asynchronous, you may worry how that's being done, and you just want to make sure you frame your questions so that the students are thinking and spending less time googling things. And you can Google check everything you're writing, um, and then just be aware that students share things online and that your lab assignment may end up online. Um, so just doing that search every so often. I have a lot of students, so I see my stuff go online faster than maybe a class of 20. So if you teach small classes, it's probably not as big a deal, but those you know bigger sections, you might wanna check more often on that. And both Bridget and my email is on there, and I'm speaking for Bridget here, so Bridget, you can make faces at me, but we're both very happy to answer emails or to share things that we've had. We've, we've been doing this together for a while, so feel free to email either one of us, and we're happy to, to share with you anything that we've got or help you out if you've got a question. I definitely second that, absolutely. Can I add something dumb for the folks that are really concerned? To me, number one, be honest. Number two, the students are going through the same things we are, so that's not a problem. And as long as you're upfront and honest with folks, I think that makes a makes a huge difference out there. Very, very good comments. And remember, we are. When, I actually want to make one more comment, and that is, many people who are thrust online, instructors and students alike saw big changes in their courses. It's important to know that student, uh, this online students in my online courses, I saw big changes there too. So it, it affected everything. It wasn't just the in-person courses suddenly going online. My online students were struggling measurably more um, after the pandemic started. So it was an across the board type of event that's still going on right now. So keep that in mind too, as you're planning. 
here's one other simple thing with stressed out is if we mess up a little bit, nobody dies. And that's something <laughs> that I came up with, you know, in nursing, we, those instructors mess up, people potentially die. And granted, there's a level of geology into hazards that that's important. But as long as we have folks that are aware of the processes that are going around them, if we mess up rock identification, unfortunately, if, for those that major, there's going to have to be a little bit of backtracking, but that's going to be at every level across society. So nobody dies. That's to me, that's something that helped me get through spring. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, special thanks to Adrian and, and Bridget for great presentations and Vince to highlight the manual and also for all the facilitators that, that led the breakout sessions um, and to all the participants, thanks for making this a really robust discussion. We hope to continue it online and in future webinars. Um, the next webinar that's part of the NAGT webinar series is navigating the Teach the Earth portal uh, with Jen Wenner on August 19th. And you can see the webinar webpage there. We'll try to, it's also in the chat. And then there in the yellow, there's a, a, a survey for this webinar. And we'd appreciate any feedback on the webinar if you could take a, a minute to fill that out before you totally move on to the next thing you're doing for the day. And if you're looking for more teaching online resources, uh, there's always the NAGT's traveling workshop program. I think the next deadline is in October 15th. And there's also the Teaching Geoscience Online NAGT webpage that has a lot of these resources and some, some uh, directions that you can go to help think about what you need to do next. Okay, thanks everybody.